Cornwall seascape painting, abstract en plein air. I climbed up the rocks with that painting box and the canvas on my back. And after setting up, I start wetting the canvas. And then I take out my sketch, the one I did previously, the watercolor sketch to make sure that I can get the composition right. And while it is still fresh in my head, I start laying out the bulk of the composition, placing the main elements on the canvas, and with that initially still wet canvas behind it all, the water and the colors will run. At this point, you really don't need uh, clear, crisp outlines, because all the edges and anything sharp and fine, fine details will be placed later. You just want to make sure that you place all the main bulk of the composition onto the canvas where it belongs. And it's, as you can see at this point, it's just an abstract. After a while, you can decide if you want to add a lot of details. You can actually turn an abstract into a highly detailed artwork. I prefer to leave it half imagined, half painted, and it's a lot easier to fiddle on and on and on until every single detail is placed on the canvas then hold it back and just keep it as an abstract. So why start with reds and yellows when the sea is blue and the grass is brown and the stone is again a very pale color. So because it's a summer day uh, starting with orange, and at this point this is a very uh, mixed orange. Some parts are more yellow, some are more orangey or red even. Uh, this will give the overall composition at the end, once I place all the other colors on it as well. This will give it a very nice and warm atmosphere. So the initial color is atmosphere. And also the initial color will determine what will be the color that will pop at the end. There are a lot of blues, of course, in a seascape, on the sky, in the water, and the opposite, the complementary color to blue is orange. So as you see, the various shades and tints of orange that I'm laying down are essentially thinking ahead I'm making sure that all the blues that I will add on top of this will pop. As for the tool in my hand is half of a kitchen sponge so it's not the most sophisticated piece of equipment but you are all familiar with it I'm sure. If it dries, if the color dries and cakes on to the sponge, because this is a hot summer day, it might happen. Uh, I won't be crying my eyes out over a 50 or 100 pound brush that I have just ruined, because this is just a kitchen sponge. Also, because it's a ki kitchen sponge, it's widely available. You can just tuck it in your pocket and tuck another one, pick out another one, and also, uh, it encourages different kinds of marks that you can make with it, really. So what you see here is the composition slowly taking shape, literally. It's the main shapes and some of the details, very few of the details that I'm making a note for. So I'm just adding a few marks to make sure that I, I know where those rocks will be, I know where the darker bits are. And you also notice that I started moving away from the orange towards these deeper reds and violets. So adding cooler colors for the shadows and adding, going back to some of those oranges, yellows, for the sunlit areas. So I'm widening the range of that orange. I'm no longer just painting with that one orange. And as I carry on, you see I begin painting with red, 
what is essentially my mind is telling me it's green or it was supposed to be green or it used to be green at the beginning of summer. It's all the grass that has dried out by the time I got there. So why paint with red? Again, the same principle. If you want those greens to stand out, you'd better put the complementary color beneath it. And besides, the browny color that you see, uh, all that dried out grass is in fact just a darker shade of red. If you take red colors or oranges to a darker, darker, darker version, you will end up with brown. So all I did was just eliminate those super dark elements, lighten them up a little bit and give it a bit of a zing, just give it back the original color without all the boring, uh, overlaying, hazy bits. So I like to think of uh, these colors that you see there as the color that is there. It might be just a, at a smaller uh, or a more gentle way. It is there. It's present. But I edit out the grays and the browns that would make it uh, way too obvious and a bit boring, to be honest. When I look at a painting and if it manages to replicate exactly the scenery, I just want to run away crying. So I feel like I'm failing when I do that. I really want to make sure that I, I bring the most exciting, the most interesting elements out of the scene and uh, record it on the canvas. So I'm moving around on the color scheme, or on the color wheel, and going through from the oranges, through the reds, towards the purples, then all the way to the blues and some of the greens, still, still working with the sponge. Every new color, and you also see that I'm working from color to color, so I'm moving around literally. You see some of those colors are still not, I haven't touched them yet. So as I move around from one color to the next, I make sure that that one color and its combinations are well balanced on the canvas. So it's really about composition, making sure that that one single color is balanced. If I delete, if I had a weight of deleting all other colors from the canvas and leave just that one blue or violet or red or yellow, then that would be a balanced composition. It would be an abstract work, of course, but it would be balanced. Now then the next thing is seeing how it interacts with the other colors and make sure that those interactions are balanced. Because depending on how light or dark, how prominent and vibrant or how pale the color is, it will interact differently with its complementaries as well as uh, neighboring colors. Now moving on to some of those yellowy greens. And turquoises. You see if I place a new color into the canvas, into the composition, then I have to make sure that I tie it in by placing the same color, finding other excuses to add that color elsewhere on the canvas. So I have to have those colors in different shapes and placed differently, so the marks look very different, but they should be there. 
again for the overall balance of the green, the yellow, the blue. Now you see that green that I just added there? If there was no red underneath it, it would be almost invisible or just generally boring. But because I have a strong orange, yellow and a bit of a purpley base be behind it, those greens are a lot more alive. And greens generally have a tendency of uh, putting the viewer to sleep. So I try to add less greens onto a canvas than what is visible in reality. Now another thing to note that I keep looking up, so every single time you see my sponge and the hand stopping over the canvas, it is basically a sign that I'm looking up, I'm capturing with my eyes, I'm trying to photograph almost uh, another detail. And then I look back down to the canvas and add it. And then I look up again, capture something else that's new, that's strong, that's the next most prominent thing that I notice, and then I add it. So it's look at the subject, look at the work, look at the subject, look at the work. Go back and forth. Don't ever forget what you are actually painting. I see a lot of times people just uh, keep fiddling around, just looking at their canvas, their work, and they forget to look up and compare or pick up new, new themes, new motives from their reference subject. You really should use that subject to inspire you. So as you notice something new that really hits you, that's gorgeous, that's just lovely, then you pick that and you add it onto the canvas. As you use white, like I'm doing here with the, the various highlights for, for the rocks, that rock face, uh, make sure that you are not using pure white. Now, of course, at this point, my sponge is dirty, so whatever I dip it into, it will be a muted color. I'm no longer able to use strong, bold, crazy, uh, vibrant colors, which is just fine because you should have a good balance of both. You should have vibrant colors as well as more muted ones, earth tones, but earth tones happen as you're working on and on. When you have done all you could with the sponge, you can switch on to the palette knife. You can start with various parts of the composition, but I like to start with what is behind everything else, and that is generally, it's the sky. So I mix something that is similar to the original uh, underpaintings sky color, and I'm adding that. Of course, it's not just that one color, but uh, as I go on, at this point I have been thinking about the composition and making decisions about color and vibrancy uh, along the way. So I know how I want to finish, how I want to uh, complete the painting. So I will be adding some vibrant colors to the sky as well. Every single time I reach back for more paint on the palette, I will pick up a slightly different mixture. Now that different mixture will need to be worked into the canvas. You cannot just stop working with one kind of a color and start working with another one next to it. So I, you can see me going back over my previous knife marks and mixing it in.
Now next thing, working from back to front, is adding some of those hazy, almost purpley blue rocks at the very back, far away. And then I begin using the same color for some of the darker shadows on the seashore. When you work with the knife, you can use either edge of the knife. You can pull it to the side. You can also stamp with it. And as you place it against the canvas, and if you have a thin layer of paint on the bottom of the palette knife, you can create these abstract, almost microscopic marks that break up uh, on top of previous marks. So especially rocks lend themselves very well to painting with the knife. And now you see the green upon the red and with red on top of it again. I should probably mention that this is just the first layer of knife marks. A lot of people leave uh, leave a painting at this stage and they just they are just happy with that one knife layer. But once this dries, once all these marks, these uh, hedges and these uh, quite textured marks, uh, they cake on, you can begin adding another layer on top and begin breaking up into smaller and smaller abstract details, the whole composition. Now you see the reason why I painted that sky with a little bit more purple is because I wanted those far away sunlit slopes to stand out against it. Again, it's that impressionistic color theory at work of complementary colors, using complementary colors to bring out the best of each. And my, my work with strong bold colors, well I, I have my own little theory for that as well. So by the time I'm done, I will be stuck, this image will be on a 60 by 60 centimeter canvas and it will be framed, it will be hanging on a wall, it will be for sale, it will probably be exhibited somewhere and then somebody buys it and they happily look at it but they have a life going on, they have a lot of stuff going on and what really made an impression on me was this larger than life surround effect all around me with the kids screaming in the water with the waves breaking on the shore with uh, with the wind slightly just the, that slight breeze blowing around me so in order to climb out of the confines of a 60 by 60 centimeter canvas I need to use every tool in my dispo at my disposal to overcome that and to climb out of that canvas and make sure that I can reach out to the viewer and make them feel the way I felt when I was there. And that is, the main tool is selecting the most prominent aspects of the scene and then using colors that evoke the kind of feelings that I had when I was there. So colors have this fantastic effect on people. It's a, it's a gut reaction that we all have to color that you cannot, uh, you cannot 
create with any other tool. So if I were using, instead of that blue and purple, if I were using black or proper gray for any of those shadowy parts of the rocks, uh, it would be less evocative of how it felt to be there. So it's really the feeling of being there that I'm painting, that I'm trying to achieve when somebody looks at the artwork. Yeah, yeah, of course, I look at, you know, the patterns and uh, I look up for inspiration. But in the end, it's a patchwork of colors that has to be well balanced, that as people look around and their eyes wander around the canvas, they feel lost on this canvas and they can remember, oh yeah, yeah, I remember how it felt like, yeah, I've been there too, or I've been to a place similar to that. Now you see some of the blues and turquoises are back. I'm painting the rocks as well as the reflection of the rocks in the water. And if you wanted to, you could add people on the beach. But the tendency is that if you add people anywhere or any human shape, form, pattern, uh, that sort of distracts from the rest of it. And at this point, I wanted to paint this magnificent seashore and the rocks. I'm a bit sorry that you have to watch this from an angle when some of the sun is reflecting on the still wet paint. And you can see the colors uh, where my shadow hits the canvas. Now that's something I can compensate for. But if you can, it's a good idea to set up the canvas in a way at an angle where it is not entirely sunlit. Because typically in the sun you will be painting uh, two or three shades darker so if you bring it inside you will notice that your artwork is a lot darker than you meant it to be now I know this so I compensate for it but uh, you might want to set up the canvas already in a in a shadowy place Okay, so a few more bits of paint, just some details, and um, at this point I'm really just making sure that there is an overall well-balanced composition. I pick out details that will draw the eye and lead the viewer's eye around the canvas the way I want them to look around. So it's almost like preparing a nice path around the canvas. So there you go. This work is pretty much finished. I took it home and I added a few well-chosen layers at the very end, but not much, really. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you and sign up if you want to see more of these.